So um, I was in the UK, United Kingdom, in order to participate in a roundtable discussion. It was not a conference in the sense that some people speak and some others listen. That was a roundtable discussion where almost everybody around the table spoke with great enthusiasm about the problems of the Middle East. And of course, even though the subject matter was how to free the Middle East from all sorts of weapons of mass destruction, including nuclear, chemical, and biological, and it, of course it was also unavoidable for every single person who uh, attended that round table to make references to the events in the past. I'm telling you this because, for instance, uh, this reading and some other readings talk so much about what happened in the past. And you might be wondering if, as why we are talking about the past events in the Middle East so much, instead of you know, speculating about present day situations and maybe about the future. Of course, in order for us to have an educated discussion here, a meaningful discussion, and for you to understand issues properly, it is essential that we learn first the, at least the very basic developments and, and why, what happened, why such things have happened, and what were their implications for other developments that followed. So therefore, uh, you should not be surprised if I'm still going to give you another reading, which is about, it is actually a United Nations report. It is the National Threat Perceptions in the Middle East which was published in mid-1990s, that is, I think, 95 or 96. And I was partly involved in this process in its final phase, because that was right after my fellowship at the United Nations Institute for Disarmament Research. And I had attended a, another roundtable uh, with the participation of most of the authors who, were, who have contributed to this research report. There, I mean, you see their perspectives about their country's threat perceptions as of mid-1990s. And I have seen just last weekend that the, the most recent reference point, for instance, uh, during the deliberations this weekend uh, with respect to the security situation in the Middle East, was the mid-1990s. I mean, because there was an important a development which was uh, the review and extension conference of the Treaty on the Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons, the MPT, and that in 1995. And because this treaty, the MPT, uh, has been reviewed every five year in five year intervals uh, since its entry into force in 1970, 75, 80, 85, 90, and some of them were quite successful in terms of uh, um, issuing a final communique or final document, but uh, some of them failed to get consensus opinion of the participants. And in 1995, according to the terms of the, the articles of the uh, MPT, the review conference and uh, actually was also an extension conference because the MPT would be extended. But the problem was how or what kind of extension procedure would be decided upon. And it was finally uh, decided uh, by consensus, of course, that the treaty be extended indefinitely and unconditionally. That means the MPT will remain in force as long as we can think of, unless uh, some countries take such actions that would render the MPT ineffective and therefore you know, um, it, it doesn't make too much sense for the rest of the countries and David Rowe, so MPT disappears, of course. Uh, at least I and not many people uh, would like to see something like that. And it was also extended unconditionally. That is, its extension was not conditioned upon on anything, upon any development. So therefore, uh, this MPD uh, Review and Extension Conference was a success. And uh, that success, of course, was somewhat uh, based on the compromise that was reached with respect to the situation in the Middle East. The MPT is a universal, universal treaty. It is not only for the Middle East. There are now 195 or so countries uh, which are members of the treaty. And um, according to this treaty, uh, five states have the right to maintain their nuclear weapons. 
to keep them as uh, legally, and the rest promise not to produce nuclear weapons. Well, that's a different situation that I can talk more uh, uh, separately. I just don't want to go into this right now. But uh, the Middle East, of course, is one of the uh, regions in the world where proliferation is of great concern. Not only proliferation of chemical wep uh, nuclear weapons, but also chemical and biological weapons, ballistic missiles being their delivery vehicles and other weapons, conventional weapons, etc. So, as I said, this uh, review, and, review and extension conference in 1995 was a success, partly because, and, or also because of this uh, Middle East resolution. The Middle East resolution actually, uh, at that point, was consisting of certain uh, commitments of the parties to the treaty, that is, uh, and one, one of which was the uh, uh, sort of spanning efforts uh, and serious and, and, and genuine efforts to create a zone free of weapons of mass destruction, actually a nuclear weapon free zone in the Middle East. So um, therefore, I've seen again this weekend while just uh, watching around the uh, people, uh, watching uh, these people sitting around the table and commenting on the situation, that they were making references again and again uh, to this 95 MPT conference and the Middle East resolution, which was part of the final document. And that was possibly one of the most recent issues. And other references were going back to the 1974 uh, Iranian Egyptian um, sort of co sponsored uh, proposal for creating a nuclear weapon free zone in the Middle East. So again, that, that is something that goes back as far back as uh, 74, some 36 years ago. And there were also some other references uh, uh, going back to as to when ir uh, Israel may have acquired its nuclear weapons. And actually, well, uh, as we all know, Israel has never acknowledged officially the presence of its nuclear weapons in its arsenal, neither, neither have they denied at any time. So this is part of their uh, security strategy, security policy, uh, to create an ambiguity that is not either acknowledge nor deny the existence of a nuclear capability. And you know what? There were people sitting around this big, actually not round table, but a, with a, a, a long a straight table. And um, there were people, and almost everyone, knows everybody else. I mean, for so many years, um, having attended meetings like this and, uh, you know, friends uh, on other occasions in different fora. But when it comes to discussing their country's uh, security issues, they all become hawks while they are those outside during the coffee breaks or dinner but, or lunch. But when it comes to discussing their country's security issues, they all, you know, act as if they were the politicians of their countries. Well, and some of them, and even though we are all friends, well, some of them are quite uh, elderly in a sense, and some of them are young, still uh, the Israeli participants refrain from using the word nuclear weapons, even though there, this is not an official setting, even though there is nothing to admit or just confess or nothing, but they still refrain from using the term nuclear weapons that keep using nuclear option, nuclear power, or nuclear capability, still living even among friends, this issue uh, ambiguous. Well, maybe uh, this is how they feel more comfortable anyway. So, uh, because and uh, there was also a discussion about some of the uh, information coming out or some documents coming out from the research of some people, uh, uh, which actually confirm what I told you here. Remember during, during the Yom Kippur War, uh, I told you that it was so believed or uh, there are uh, sort of information out there uh, or some people have written about this already that the Israeli parliament, the Knesset, had seriously discussed the possibility of resorting to nuclear option again uh, as a way to break this encirclement and uh, sort, of, sort of save the country from the brink of destruction. And some, uh, when it came to the 
point of convincing the Arab countries that Israeli nuclear capability uh, was actually not against any country to, to sort of uh, uh, bully them, just to, to uh, force them to do anything, but a weapon of last resort to protect the country from destruction in case in the future. They have given this example. If we have not used our or resorted to our nuclear option back in 1973 during the Yom Kippur War, when else would we uh, sort of do this? So th why don't you believe in us that we don't have any ambition to use our nuclear weapons against you. So th this sort of discussion, actually there are a couple of other conferences uh, in the future, but I'm not going to attend because I just, I'm quite, uh, uh, you know, satisfied with this one. And I don't think I'm going to hear anything new. So therefore I uh, spent my time with you here rather than with, uh, you know, other, my colleagues and friends whom I would like to see again, of course. but. Um, traveling, going back and forth, and piled up work here while I'm, I'm away. So, and not so much breakthroughs in the uh, developments uh, uh, from another month, uh, from t this month to another month. So therefore, this issue is likely to remain with us for the foreseeable future, meaning next year, next five years, 10 years, or maybe even longer. So as I said, there are references Whenever an Israeli, a Palestinian, an Iraqi, a Jordanian, an Egyptian, an American, when they all sit around at the table and talk about nuclear security issues, this is unavoidable for any one of them to make reference to, you have done this in the past and you have done that in the past, etc., etc. So therefore, the past is important. I mean, of course, I would like to uh, discuss the current affairs as much as uh, you know, time would al allow us to do so. But without knowing uh, the background of issues, it will be a futile uh, discussion. I mean, you would understand possibly what is going on here with respect to Iranian nuclear capabilities. But when you leave the classroom, some of the things uh, that you might have you know, uh, discussed or heard here uh, would have just gone out of your mind. So therefore, it is essential that you understand the basics. And, there, and this is the reason why this is going to be uh, your next reading. Well, this is something that I use in my courses uh, quite uh, frequently. And therefore, I believe e-copies of, of this sort of uh, uh, material, national threat perceptions in the Middle East, must be present in the reserve, or we may, you must have access uh, from the internet. But if this is not the case, or just in case, I will still ask uh, for my assistant to leave a hard copy of this uh, to the reserve section, and you can go ahead and make your own copies. And it is therefore important because Anul just asked uh, if I could give some tricks about the midterm exam. Actually, I gave you a lot of tricks. I mean, I don't make tricks, by the way. When I give you an exam, I just want you to show me that you were serious in taking this course and that you did spend uh, at least a certain amount of effort to understand a subject and learn subject. What is essential here is not me grading you. It is you to learn something when you leave this uh, university, when you leave this classroom, this department, this university. Most of your parents, or the parents of most of you actually pay large sums of money here and uh, they are highly qualified professors all around. So take this opportunity and learn the best you can, otherwise you, will, uh, you may regret in the future. So therefore, uh, for the midterm, I, I always said I'm not going to ask you a question which is open to sort of subjective debate. That is, well, according to me, this is it. According to you, that might be different. No. Because, um, I mean, if I ask you something like that and if you disagree with me, which is quite normal, I'm not, you know, in a position to say everything I say here is, the, you know, you know uh, is the rule. So, therefore, this is, there is not going to be any subjective questions. There is nothing uh, that will be uh, open to speculation or to sort of uh, uh, at least intellectual disagreement. But there will be uh, questions, most possibly, and I, I'll try to make it as many as possible so that you can pick the ones that you, know, you, you feel more comfor comfortable in answering. 
I may give you two or maybe three options uh, in two parts and where you would just pick up one of them and then answer the one that you believe you, you, you know better. So, and of course, it is always important to make analysis. Be, you know, writing something analytical is difficult. And analytical thinking is, is essential, which differs, uh, um, differentiates you from all other living creatures, including all of us here. So therefore, um, this cause, uh, cause and consequences issue or implications type questions might be uh, significant. Excuse me, would you put that away? Um, so therefore, um, I mean, I would recommend you to revise your readings and also go over the issues that we have discussed here in the classroom. There is this PowerPoint, of course, when I ask you something, if or I ask you something from the PowerPoints, I just don't want the bullet point type of answers. I want complete sentences, right? So don't memorize this. Try to understand and reflect the essence, the gist of it. I mean, not just one, two, three, so make complete sentences. Otherwise, this is not analytical, this is memorizing. I mean, well, uh, memory is a good thing, but unless you have the ability to analyze your, whatever you have in, as input in your mind, so it doesn't make too much sense. Anyway, so uh, going back to our subject matter. The situation in the Middle East has been there, is there, will be there at all times. As far as I can see, there is no uh, big breakthrough in the near future, but there are some chances which we have discussed again equally, uh, that it, they should not be missed. Because um, some of you may have followed from the news, and actually just a, a footnote here, if you are international relations students or political science students, I mean, you should definitely follow the news. Read some magazines such as The Economist, Time, Newsweek, or Turkish magazines uh, that you can find here, uh, reporting um, events, analyzing events, or uh, publishing analytical pieces. And also, uh, you know, keep abreast with the developments in the world. I mean, just coming here, uh, listening to your professors, and then uh, going out, and then going to coffees and watching some TV serials, well, that doesn't make any difference if, if you're st studying here or just not studying here. So take this uh, uh, and follow the world events. I'd, I'd like to uh, sort of, uh, this reminded me another uh, thing that I would like to share with you here. It was, I believe, two, or two years ago. One of my students was the uh, head of delegation of Syria uh, in the uh, assimilation. And that student, well, on the day of simulation, and I was the uh, UN Secretary General at that point because no one volunteered, and I did not ask from anybody because actually I asked from some people, but they refrained. They thought it would be too difficult, and I believe Chala doesn't think that way. And uh, at some point in the second round of the simulation, there was an issue with respect to Syria, and I was amazed with uh, when that student said something that had just taken place a few hours ago. I mean, when I say a few hours ago, because it uh, happened somewhere, I, I think in New York, and, and the simulation was in the morning. And that student said um, what the Syrian ambassador had said or told at the UN, uh, I think UN body, either Security Council or General Assembly. I was really amazed with that because I had followed it myself, but that was like 4 a.m. in the morning, and I, which is uh, quite normal for me because I'm staying up late almost every day. But that student saying this, I said, how did you know that? He said, I checked the website of BBC before coming here and updated my knowledge. So that's the kind of student what I expect to see at all times. I know I don't want you to, uh, you know, stay up late or maybe not sleep that much. But I mean, take it seriously, all right? This is an important thing. And uh, these years will somehow pass. And most likely, unless you have done 
So if you don't benefit, you, you may regret. So, all right. This, uh, the Middle East. The, we have studied the situation in Iraq. Iraq, in, Iraq invaded Kuwait. And then in the hands of the coalition forces, Iraq was defeated. Then was subject to uh, sanctions, which uh, were part of the um, uh, ceasefire resolution 687. And there were also this uh, special commission, ANSCOM, which did a certain job. The IAEA uh, demolished the infrastructure, nuclear infrastructure. ANSCOM went corrupt at some point. Not all of them, but some of them, and therefore was replaced by ANMOVIC. Then we have seen, uh, especially there was, a, if not a pause, but just the shift of interest of world powers from the Middle East to the Balkans because of the war in the Balkans and more specifically some other developments like NATO extension in Europe, Central Eastern Europe. And then came 9-11 and after 9-11 again the United States in particular uh, uh, shifted its uh, focus on Iraq again which uh, paved the way to the second Iraq war in 2003. So all of these developments of course very negatively affected the Iraqi population in the first place. Many of them, hundreds of thousands of them, we don't know the exact figure. Because the last census uh, in Iraq, I mean population count in Iraq was conducted, if I'm not mistaken, in 1957. And then onwards there was no such thing. And we, did, we, we, did, we don't have any exact opinion about what was the population when the war uh, uh, broke out in 1991 and uh, afterwards how many people died because of sanctions or because of this uh, situation especially and uh, after the uh, second Iraq war 2003 there is this internal war a civil war or war among factions among the militia groups which seems to have been subdued a little bit not so much maybe as was the case back in 2004 2005 2006, but still you, there is no single that we, that we don't hear any uh, news about explosions, or suicide bombings, or uh, roadside bombs, improvised explosive devices, uh, IEDs, etc., taking uh, the lives or claiming the lives of dozens of people sometimes. But when compared to the past, of course, uh, now Iraq is a little bit, uh, comparatively speaking, not so much yet. Even after the elections, there's still not a government, but things seem to be a little bit more promising when compared to back uh, 2004, 2007 pre period when with the bloodiest civil war uh, in the history of the country took place. These are all things about Iraq, and uh, there is so much to it. And we can talk about Iraqi situation maybe throughout the rest of the semester if you like to do so. But of course, this being a course on the Middle East security issue and Middle East is composed of a number of states, 22 of them being Arab states. And uh, there's also Iran, Israel, and Turkey, non-Arab nations. Well, Turkey is not so much counted uh, in the Middle East, but for uh, understandable reasons, you know, Turkey has now big interest uh, in the Middle East and also following the events for reasons that we will discuss in the coming uh, weeks. But what happened in Iraq happened in Iraq and affected the lives of millions of people. So what about the situation in the rest of the Middle East? How did the war in the Middle East, in Iraq actually, uh, affect the situ situation, the lives of people in all around the Middle East and also the, the interests of states in the Middle East. Because what happens in Iraq definitely has caused a number of uh, uh, consequences, had implications, repercussions for the rest of the region. So can you tell me, I mean just before me going into the details of uh, what happened here, what, what happened there, and how the, uh, this particular country was affected in, in what way from you know, Iraqi situation, I'd like to hear more from you. I mean, what in your opinion, and based on your knowledge, um, or raw knowledge, let's say, if you have not carried out any studies so far on your own, what is your 
perception, so to speak, uh, about how the rest of the region was or might have been affected by the war in Iraq? Yes, um, now I'm soliciting some answers. Excuse me? <laughs> the Iraq war. I mean, how did the situation in Iraq affect the rest of the region in terms of security situation? Fatih, go ahead. Speak up. Yeah, I mean, we will. We talked about it. We'll talk about it later. But let's talk about other countries. Yes, there is this situation in the northern part, which has implications for Turkey. Let's put aside Turkey and the internal situation in Iraq, but focus more on Syria, I feel like Jordan, Egypt, Israel, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Iran. Well, there are too many of other countries. So, well, uh, when was that? Because there was. Why not secure problem? Mm -hmm. So uh, many Iraqis have left their homes because of the war, and you talk about post-2003 war. I mean, right after the 2003. All right. So and uh, Syria, and because these borders between Iraq and Syria are not, you know, borders that you see in Europe where, I mean, you are stopped if there is a passage from another country uh, to another country, and if, of course, you're not part of the, uh, you're not one of the citizens of, of these, one of these countries. So these borders are not necessarily properly maintained or secured, and they are, called, they are said to be porous. I mean, everyone and everything can, can pass through. So many people left their homes behind, wealth, uh, whatever they had, uh, in, in sort of intangibles behind, and they have taken their, their money, their, some of their precious assets, and themselves, and went into Syria. Well, this, this is one thing that we cannot discount. I mean, this is important. It is uh, not something that, that, that is trivial. As uh, Fatih just said, it has caused a number of uh, economic problems, at least for Syria, whose economy is not necessarily in very good shape. And therefore, with the influx of a number of refugees, uh, the situation has not got any better. And of course, same applies to Jordan, for instance. Many Iraqis have crossed into the Jordanian territory and sought some refuge, some, some, they, they, they look for some jobs. Some of them had a, a certain uh, amount of money, as I said, they went to Jordan and bought houses and started a new life in Jordan. Yeah, this, this is one thing that I would agree is important. What other things? Yes. Um, Issa. So, a Arab, Isan Arab, which Arab you use, okay? Arab suggests that Iran, in a sense, has become much more ambitious in terms of exerting its influence on specifically Iraq and also in general on the rest of the region, especially the, the, the Gulf region. Yes, this had a number of implications. And, well, of course, it is not possible to speak about some exact figures and um, some official sources, although there are some uh, official sources which speculate on this, but it is not, a, uh, not always possible to provide evidence. But there is this belief, which is quite pervasive among the scholars and experts, that Iran has at least uh, some 35 up to 50,000 people, or even if they, are, they may not be Iranians, these are people who have had some trainings in the Iranian territory, the Mahdi army, Mahdi Ordusu. And uh, of course, because of this Shia link, because Iranians are overwhelmingly Shia uh, from the Shia sect of uh, Islam, and therefore there is this connection between Iran and the Iraqi Shia. 
Well, this is, of course, somewhat, uh, if not superfluous, but very general interpretation of the situation. Because when you talk with the representatives of Shia Iraqis, um, they do not necessarily agree with you that they are under the influence of Iran. And some of them outright you know, uh, reject the idea that they say, no, there is what is called Iraqi nationalism. We are Iraqis, not Iranians. Yes, Shia is our common denominator, but we are not under the influence of Iran. Who says what, of course, from, uh, at some point doesn't make too much sense. And when you look at the situation on the ground, uh, it is not possible to deny that Iran has an influence. And Iran has used this uh, in some respects, one of which, as, and we will talk more about this when we will discuss uh, Iranian nuclear program here, one of, one of the uh, ways Iran used, the, used its influence on the Shia Iraqis was to you know, sustain a, a, a certain level of resistance against the coalition forces or now U.S. forces and also to some extent the British forces. And Brits have really uh, uh, sort of uh, have been fed up with all these uh, attacks on their soldiers and that was significant in the withdrawal of British soldiers from Iraq about a year ago. So and also uh, that was the reason why uh, American soldiers have suffered so many in terms of uh, uh, lives lost and also those who were wounded. So Iran, that's one uh, particular country in the Middle East which also itself was affected from the situation in Iraq, but also starting from a point onwards um, started to affect or at least use its influence or take advantage of the situation. And this is so in foreign policy in international politics, every country tries to benefit from the opportunities that emerge and try to avoid risks that, that somehow emerge as well. All right, what else? Who else? Who, who is in? Yes, go ahead. Oh, yeah. Yeah, this is correct. For instance, Saudi Arabia was affected from the Iraq war in many ways. And this is, of course, not only limited to how Iran has increased its influence in Iraq as well as in the region as a rising Shiite power because uh, Saudi Arabia, they are Sunnis. And um, they see you know, the rise of Iran as well. Ter uh, territorial wise, so Saudi Arabia may be even bigger. Well, actually, it's bigger than uh, Iran. And in terms of economic wealth, like oil and gas, Saudi Arabia is still number one. But when it comes to population, Saudi Arabia's population is very low when compared to Iranian population. And also, militarily speaking, or speaking about military, military capabilities, Iranian military capabilities are far more advanced, or at least, if not advanced, maybe in some categories, but uh, sort of uh, a much more um, uh, significant in terms of numbers, in terms of uh, maintenance levels, in terms of training, and in terms of overall capability and you know maybe ability to conduct wars or uh, uh, other, other types of fighting. So Saudi, Saudi Arabia was definitely concerned and also uh, took some steps in order to improve its country's security situation, but Iran's position within Iraq and also in the region has caused, uh, of course, serious concerns for, for Saudi Arabia. Again, when it comes to our discussion with respect to Iranian nuclear program, past, present, and the future, we will see how Saudi Arabia reacted to that and what kind of implication uh, there may be for, for the region and for Saudi Arabia in particular. All right, what else? Yushra? Mm -hmm. 
on how far the U.S. would go, and uh, they would support uh, radical groups like terrorist groups and anti Islamic groups. Um, this is a this is a very good point. It's an important point because actually, this is something that leads the way to another dimension of the war. I mean, now we're talking about states as the actors, but there's also this other dimension to it, which is the non-state actors, which, of course, have been there at all times, maybe as long as we can go back in history, because there is this talk of uh, Muslim brothers in Egypt and other uh, groups in other countries in Yemen, Saudi Arabia, Iran, Iraq, etc., and Jordan, Palestinians. But uh, Bushra says, because of the extended uh, uh, duration of the stay uh, of, of the United States in the region, starting with, of course, uh, the first deployment back in 1990 as a reaction to Iraq's invasion of Kuwait uh, in Saudi Arabia, Qatar, United Arab Emirates, and uh, Iran here, and just to expel, the, you know, push the Iraqi forces out as part of the 678 uh, uh, six, uh, resolution in order to free to liberate the Kuwaiti territory, then they, they stay there for a, lo for a long time. Because uh, not only that, it was not that easy to uh, sort of withdraw all 600,000 troops all the way back overnight, but also countries in the region were concerned about their um, uh, security in the, in the coming years and decades, and therefore ask, kindly ask, from the United States to stay there. And the United States was, of course, looking forward to such an opportunity to have a reason, to have a reason to have a foothold on, in the region. So therefore, the US presence, and, but extended presence in, the, in terms of time, a prolonged uh, presence of the United States in the region, fueled the hatred, especially after uh, uh, the, you know, seeing people dying under sanctions, or you know um, what was happening uh, every day in Iraq, so this has fueled the uh, hatred uh, with respect to the uh, image of the United States or against the United States, which made it all the more easier for radical groups to not only become even more radical but also to recruit new people, and which uh, the, the, this region was already conducive. Uh, was re already uh, the, the ground was already fertile, the soil was already fertile for such radical groups to emerge, grow, and expand their influence, which uh, finally led the way to 9/11. And one of the uh, reasons why 9/11 uh, happened, many people believe, because it, it is so said by Osama bin Laden, was the uh, you know, freeing the, the holy territory, holy lands of Islam from the foreign troops. And the presence of U.S. troops, non-Muslim troops, on the holy lands of Islam caused deep hatred and also uh, made them committed to take the revenge from the uh, United States and from all other you know, Western powers or the so-called infidels who are not part of the Islamic world. So therefore, this is one reason that we will separately discuss in the coming weeks under the title of uh, terrorism and, and the consequence of terrorist activities. So what else and who else? Dollar? <laughs> Iraq. So Syria, uh, Dalar says, uh, is it your opinion or is it something that you refer to other people? Because Syria has always uh, denied it. And uh, no one accepts something like that. <laughs> you wouldn't accept, you wouldn't expect the Syrian authorities to say, yes, we harbor terrorists in our territory. This is not something that will come anyway. Even Turkish security forces, security units, intelligence units, civil military and other units have sort of submitted the thick reports to their counterparts in Syria. And even President uh, Demirel, or as Prime Minister, uh, submitted to his counterpart, uh, Assad, uh, you know, files of Syrian intelligence support 
to the PKK, they always said, we don't know anybody like Abdullah Jalan here. I mean, when the Turkish intelligence service uh, people gave the, you know, transcripts of telephone conversations Öcalan from his house in Damascus. Well, these things are never acknowledged. But what do you say is after the Iraq war, uh, for a long period, Syria was accused of harboring uh, a number of, uh, if not the entire sort of personnel, let's say, elements of the uh, insurgent groups, but their uh, most uh, important people, the leading figures, um, w within this in insurgents group and provided them refuge. Well, this is wh what is uh, so believed uh, in the Western circles, especially in the United States. And there was also, remember this debate about where did the Iraqi chemical, biological weapons and ballistic missiles go? Because ANSCOM left in December 98 and issued a report which was accepted by the United Nations Security Council with unanimity of votes in the presence of Iraqi observer that some weapons and material that could be weaponized might have remained there, impl implying this, if not specifically stating that. But then uh, some four years later, when the new inspection commission, UNMOVIC, uh, uh, stepped into the Iraqi territory and talked with their Iraqi counterparts, they said, look, we don't have any such weapons, and we destroyed the remaining parts, so, uh, but they couldn't prove, uh, or they couldn't provide any evidence about that. Many people believe that this material, I mean, chemical, biological, and ballistic weapons or uh, material that could be weaponized might have gone uh, into the Syrian territory. Well, of course, if Syrian authorities do not accept that, that might be because they really may not have done anything. Well, we should, of course, as academics and students here, we're not in a position to judge anybody. But they may, of course, not accept that because they may not really know what may have happened here. Because no one could claim to have full control of the borders. And you may not know exactly who entered or what entered into the borders uh, or in, into the era, uh, Syrian territory. All right? So therefore, if some intelligence report suggests that Syria may have had a role, then that might be true or not true, we don't know. So let's give a break here and we'll continue after a 10 minute break. <laughs>